And the misconception in startup business is that startup business is going to be awesome. I'll tell you what, you couldn't be fucking further from the truth. You know, that fairy tale founder startup business story, uh, I don't actually think exists. So if, if you're listening to guys on Instagram who are doing that, you should stop and recalibrate, right? Because uh, it's probably one of the most hardest things that you could do. How do startups create awareness and build a customer base, especially when competing with larger established companies? Yeah, um, yeah, there's a couple of things there. Establish awareness, so that's sort of, um, you know, a grabbing hold of some of the market uh, and competition. Uh, a couple of challenging verticals there. Uh, I'm going to start with the competition first uh, and then the marketing thing. I'll, I'll come in a little bit later. But uh, you should have already done your due diligence if you're going to the market as a startup, uh, 100%. Um, and if you haven't, um, that's a that's a bit of a foul, right? Because uh, you that's just to me that's just a, a logical step in business. Um, so if you were selling, um, you know, uh, selling a product, say it's coffee machines, right, to, to a market, uh, and you were wholesaling those, right, and selling them to uh, cafes, for example, who are businesses or leasing it to them. Um, you would need to go and look at in that particular area, city or country, how many, well, the first thing was establish um, how big is the market, right? So you can look at maybe some GDP, maybe you can look at retail trends, um, you know, uh, market trends in that particular uh, industry. And you could, you, you could also, um, you know, uh, just do your general research on the ground, right? Do some mystery shopping, uh, and you might have a little bit of a feel for it, right? But you've got to get the numbers into a spreadsheet because you need to understand who your competitor is and how many they are. And the byproduct of that, which is pretty cool, is that you can look at what they're doing. If you found out who the top three suppliers in your space were in a particular city, say you're in Boston, right? So you're in, you're in Boston and there were 400 suppliers, but three of them were miles ahead of the rest. The beautiful thing about doing research is you get to understand and deep dive on those three competitors and find out what they're doing that's separating themselves from the other competitors, right? Uh, and, and, and try to execute that in your business. So what you're doing is you're sort of trying, you're improving your business all at the same time. So competitor research is quite valuable. People think, well, I'll make decisions opposite to what they do and that's how I'll, I'll be different, right? Original. But why do you need to be original? Like you should think about that. Like if, if, if they're a great um, supply to that particular vertical that you, you're passionate about and you want to get into, learn from them. You know, don't try and do something different to them. You'll probably fail. You should find out what are all the things they're doing right. I'm going to execute against that. I'm going to bring up my PL. And as I'm doing that, I might innovate and learn more about the market. And then once I've iterated a hundred times, I can start to create my own IP for my own brand. So I'm going to be different to those top three guys. That would be my advice. So do your do your market research first. Um, and then you won't need to ask that question uh, because competitors are competitors and I don't really look at competitors to tell me what to do. Uh, I do look at them for pricing. That's that's probably about it. Um, I've made a decision in any company that I run is that we have no competitors, right? So you need to differentiate yourself in the market. Uh, why is your product different to your competitors? And if it is and you can legitimize that, sincerely and honestly and transparently, well, fuck those guys. You should just run your game and move on with it and not even worry about competitors because, look, I know that I said looking at the top competitors is great, uh, but what if all the competitors in your market are pretty average? So just be careful with how you analyze that. You would analyze that based on um, uh, gross revenue. Like, you know, uh, if the average supplier in that market's making $1 million a year and these guys are making 10, yeah, you want to look at those guys. But the, if the average is a million and these guys are making 1.1, 1 .1, uh, you want to be very careful that you're not uh, implementing uh, poor models in, in, inside your company. Um, so that would be my advice on competitors. I say don't worry about them. Use them for Intel uh, and IP. Um, learn from their costings and their modeling. Look at what they're doing wrong identify it and then do the opposite to that. Hey, a good thing to do that I, that I do a lot is I go to a competitor's um, a Google reviews, right? Uh, and normally the, the customer is quite transparent telling, telling the public, everyone on the planet, what they're doing wrong. 
And so you know that that's a pain point for your market, right? For your customer, or your client, uh, and you should you can implement implement that into your mission statement, implement that into your processes and policies, and implement it into your sales process. So valuable, and it's free. So when you're doing that competitor analysis, you're going to pull so much data from that process. It's highly valuable, highly valuable. I, I would highly recommend that everybody do that. What are some common mistakes or misconceptions that can lead to failure in the startup world and how can these be avoided? Mistakes and misconceptions, slightly different things. I'll probably talk more about misconceptions, right? Because I think the mistakes are a byproduct of the misconception, right? Uh, and the misconception in startup business is that Startup business is going to be awesome. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, you couldn't be fucking further from the truth. At the start, I'm talking about startup business, remember. So uh, it's hard, super hard. Uh, it's stressful. Um, it's frustrating. Um, you know, you've got to be pretty resilient. And I think that misconception is that, um, you know, that fairy tale founder startup business story. Uh, I don't actually think exists. So if, the, if you're listening to guys on Instagram who are doing that, you should stop and recalibrate, right? Because uh, it's probably one of the most hardest things that you could do. Um, and let me wrap a little bit of context around that for you. Um, and the reason why it's hard is because you, if it's a startup business, it either tells me two things. You've never started a business before or you have and you've failed, right? Um, those are the only two uh, areas in which you can do a startup business. So you failed here, or look, you've got a job and you're, you're going into it, but that's still the start of a startup business, right? So it's like normally the first time. So let's just pretend it's that. And you know nothing. Uh, and if you've read all the business books on the planet, uh, they will help you. Don't get me wrong. That'll give you some intelligence. But um, the thing about business is very emotional um, and it requires lots of different soft skill sets that you can't read in a book. And the first thing is if you can't deal with stress and pressure, um, don't go into business for yourself. Now I've said this many times before and I'm pretty passionate about it. If you can't handle the pressure, um, don't do it. What's that saying? Uh, if you can't handle the heat, stay out of the kitchen. I don't know, something like that. Um, um, there's one for the chefs. Um, but you know, it's difficult. It's really, really hard. and uh, it's harder than I thought it would be, um, and I've failed a lot, all right, uh, but you have to get up, and then you have to just keep going, uh, and here's the thing. You have to take all the shit. Uh, you are responsible for everything in your company, uh, whether you want to accept that or not. Uh, it's on your shoulders, right, so that can be pretty damaging to some people, uh, and I do speak to founders who suffer from mental hardship uh, because it's because of running a business is so difficult and they don't know what they're doing. The, one of the worst things I think is isolation is that you're sort of on your own. Um, so if you don't know how to handle the punches, you get bruised very quickly and it lasts for a very long time. Uh, so you need to put some uh, investment into that space. But look, if you're naturally attuned not to be quite strong and resilient, um, It'll be very difficult for you, uh, and I know people are not going to like me saying that, but it's the truth because I see it all the time. Um, like I'm pretty resilient, I'm pretty strong uh, psychologically. I'm I'm very strong. Um, you know, I, I can take a lot of punches, and it just doesn't phase me. And I've always been like that. So you know, I could never work for somebody else. And I think maybe sometimes founders founders are just engineered for that, uh, and we sort of know that, right? That's why entrepreneurs are, are, are a little bit crazy. Uh, it's because we can handle that stuff because we don't care what other people think. Um, so we just we just kick on. But if you're not that person and you're moving into a startup business, um, psychologically you have to be sound. Um, you got to you got to be able to handle the obstacles and the challenges every day for days on end, years on end. In fact, you know that now I think it used to be it used to be three to five years your business could fail as a startup. Uh, now it's probably six to twelve months, right? Um, so that's even more difficult. So you've got to start up faster than you did 10 years ago, uh, which is more stressful uh, and you have more competition and the market is harder. But there is an abundance of opportunity because of computation power, you know, 5G, 6G, Starlink. There's all this technology in the market that's going to make a startup business more successful than it was 10 years ago. But psychologically, I think we've moved into a bit of a woke society and it's, I think, psychology uh, and mental hardship. Um, by the way, I don't call it mental illness for, for a reason. I think those are two separate things. Mental illness and mental hardship are not the same thing in my mind. 
uh, so I'll just call it mental hardship, is that, uh, and that's just from stress and anxiety and pressure, right? Um, and, and that happens a lot in business. Um, and in fact, there's two primary places it comes from is a, a relationship, a, a relationship that's not firing, uh, and your day job. You know, um, those are the two places because that's where you occupy most of your time. When you're hanging out with your mates and your friends and you're playing your video games and you're driving your Ferrari and you're, you know, uh, jumping out of planes and going on holiday, those are the happiest times of your life. The hardest times of your life, uh, two things, uh, if your relationship is not great uh, or if your business is not working or your job's not great, right? So you got to get it on point. Uh, so just be honest with yourself about it. Speak to people about it. Seek professional advice. Uh, keep your body health on point and just deal with it uh, like a grown-up um, because if you want to blame everyone around you and you want to blame the government, you know, uh, the sun, the rain, God or whoever it may be, uh, just don't start in the first place because that's not the problem. The problem will be you. Um, so uh, that would be my advice in terms of trying to manage and navigate all of that. I hope that helped. How do you plan for the long-term sustainability of the startup? Uh, the first thing is you have to take responsibility. I just said that before. Um, that's how you can get sustainability uh, is, is, um, is taking responsibility. Second thing is intelligence. Uh, watching your financials, watching your economics, knowing how to execute, right? I really think execution is one of the strongest skill sets for an entrepreneur. Uh, is identifying a problem, innovating and executing over and over and over again, uh, I think is critical. Um, you know, the, the, the compounding effect of that is success uh, because you sort of can't fail on that methodology or in that business model is that if at first you don't succeed, try and try again, uh, is, is I'm down with that. I think that's awesome because um, failure only occurs when you stop, right? And I know that's pretty cliche. You've probably seen that on Instagram a thousand times, but it's true, right? Um, you just have to keep iterating. So that's how you get sustainability in a business. Um, I truly believe that. Uh, I don't think it's too much else. Of course, you've got to manage your money well, you know, you might have to have a Series A, Series B, uh, whatever, investors, VC guys, angel guys, all that sort of stuff. Like, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is if you're selling a product online or a service or, or, or it's Uber, for example, um, let's stick on the Uber thing. Hey, Travis Kalanick. Uh, hope all is well, buddy. Um, so, you know, if you're you, – you're going to get it wrong. Like, you, you were just going to get it wrong. Many things will go wrong in business, hence the stress and anxiety thing. But how you overcome that is by innovation, fixing the problem, uh, getting the right expertise, being intelligent, innovating, and re-executing. And here's the thing. You can innovate till the cows come home or the sheep or whatever other animal you have on your farm. Um, but until you execute, it's not worth anything uh, to anybody. So it's all about execution. I think success is totally execution, uh, executing well as well, um, but iterating and executing multiple times. I think the average innovation and execution strategy for a startup is probably in the vicinity of a thousand times, right? Um, I read it, read a white paper a, a long time ago. It's probably completely changed, but, but think about that, that you will fail a thousand times. Now, if you don't innovate or execute against any of that, uh, you probably won't last 12 months. But if you're constantly doing that, looking inside your business and yourself uh, and fixing all the problems and understanding why they occurred in the first place, fixing them to make sure they don't happen again, and then executing against that in your business, uh, you will never fail. I think it's impossible to fail in that environment. So that would be uh, my, my, my number one thing to say in response to that question. Uh, and it's just that. All the other stuff you got to do, you get it. You'll figure that stuff out. Uh, uh, and here's the thing. If it's not broken, and people say this thing, right? They go, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, I think that is totally bad advice. Um, just because it's not broken, it doesn't mean you can't innovate it and make it better. All right? So what happens is complacency sets in, right? Uh, the business is ticking along. It's making 10% growth uh, sales every quarter. Well, hey, great, but why is it not 100%? Why is it only 10%? Uh, so great companies don't, uh, don't do that, right? What they do is they innovate on the things that are broken first, and then they innovate on the things that are not broken second. Uh, and that would be my advice. That's how I think you grow a great business. Um, the, the other thing is, I would say as part two to that, is have a purpose, right? Um, I'm working on a strategy now, which is an MTP 
um, strategy or, or, or an XO strategy, EXO strategy. Uh, working with Peter Diamandis to, to, to try and um, execute against that. Uh, and there's a foundation of that. Um, and it, look, it's a simple one, right? To be an exponential company. In the 20th century, they had great companies, right? Um, and and, and if, when I do the research, I look at some of the, say, the Fortune 500, for example. If you look at the top 100 in the Fortune 500 uh, 20 years ago, uh, none of them are in the top 100 anymore. You know, they're just not. It's because then they weren't exponential. So what that means is they didn't innovate. Uh, they, they acquired a large part of the market. They capitalized that, which is great. But what, ha- what they didn't see happening is what I said before is the, the computation power changing. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the element of physics operating in a, in, a, in a business community. If you took, say, Moore's Law, for example, where if you fold something in on itself, it just doesn't double because it compounds, right? So it's normally, you know, um, two, four, eight, and 16, and it just keeps growing, right? I think they use that um, Moore's Law uh, component uh, against the silicon chip, right? And that for 52 years, that silicon chip did not only uh, improve itself by two, two X, uh, it uh, became exponential. And I think uh, after 52 years, it was improving itself by 150 or 250 times. Now, what that means is uh, how big is your purpose, right? Um, you should think about that. Um, so I'm doing an MTP strategy, which is a massive transformative purpose strategy. So, and get everyone on board with that. So why, why are you going into the business in the first place? Uh, and I said that uh, earlier on in the set, is it just to make money? Well, cool, no harm, no foul. If that's what you want to do, you should do that. But understand that you won't grow the company exponentially to a point where it's big and sustainable and it will last forever. Um, and I think you can do that now, especially with um, technology and computation. I think it's. I, I think it's. In, I think there's a huge opportunity there. Uh, if I ta- if I think about AI, and I know I talk about that a bit because I love it. But um, you know, uh, if you're an early adopter, um, people say, "Oh, AI is going to take over the, uh, everyone's jobs." Well, it's actually not. It's going to be the people who know how to use AI who are going to take people's jobs. Um, so the humans will still be there working for the AI overlords. That was sarcasm, by the way. Um, so just think about that. You know, what's your what's your massive transformative purpose in your startup? And I would advise that you dive into that even before you start the company, you know, whether it's with a friend or a group of people and sit down and talk about, well, why are we doing this in the first place? If you're looking at sustainability, that's really what makes a business sustainable, um, you know, is that you have a purpose and that everyone's on board with it uh, because... Well, I think I remember Microsoft's one when I read that uh, when they first released that many, many years ago in the 40s, 42, I think it was. That was a joke as well. Um, I think Bill Gates came up with to what's your massive transformative purpose? And he says uh, to have a desktop computer in every home in America. Like that's pretty big. Um, You know, and his thing was we can educate the world with this tool. Uh, and uh, and he did. <laughs> They've changed that now. I can't remember what it was. I know that it's published on their on their public website, so I might go check that out and talk about that in the future. But um, but that's another component. So those two things would be um, where, where I would start and consider uh, how your business can be sustainable. Uh, look, I hope you found something that you liked or that you think may work for your business. Love to hear any comments. If you got them, just drop them through uh, and we're happy to come back and answer any of those comments. Uh, if you haven't already, look, we're a nonprofit uh, venture. So click the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell, uh, wherever that may be on the screen. We'd love for you to subscribe. We try to push out as, as much content and good content as we can. Uh, and we've got some great interviews coming up with some some pretty awesome entrepreneurs and artists. So, so stay tuned for that. Really appreciate your watching and uh, look forward to speaking to you next time.